Hey, Pastor Mike here. I just wanna thank you for tuning in and let you know that we have more resources like this available for you on our website. Just a quick note before we begin though. While resources like this can help you grow in ways that God has ordained for you, they are no replacement for gathering with your local church on Sunday. And on that note, if you're not currently connected somewhere, we want you to know you're always invited to Grace Point. Visit our website for time and location, and we hope to see you soon. Miracles don't just happen in the Bible. We ask Jesus for them every day. When we ask for healing like we've done this morning, when we ask for breakthroughs, when we ask for reconciliation with our relationship and our relationships with people that we have broken relationships with, we're asking for miracles. And you see miracles very regularly when you see those things happen, and yet we live in a time where people go, ah, oh, there's just no more miracles happen today. Where are the eyes of our hearts? They're certainly not faithful. We're not looking for what we want to think is a miracle or call, label a miracle. One author tries to capture the confidence that we should feel when we ask Jesus for a miracle. He says, Jesus will never turn his back against us and is there to help us. Sometimes we don't agree with his decisions, but Jesus knows what is right for us. He created us and has the right to do as he pleases. Perhaps the most challenging prayer someone can pray, especially in our times of most desperate need, when our desires are at their peak, our frailty, our weaknesses at its lowest, is a prayer like Jesus, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Maybe you pray, not my will, but yours be done, Lord, because you have a trust within you that, that what you see is not all there is. And because Jesus sees more, he's able to take everything into account and therefore has the, the right view of things to know what is right and what ought to be for his will, for his sovereign will to come about. But maybe you pray one of this prayer's cousins the cousin of, Lord, please, 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 my will. Maybe you pray that because it's difficult to accept alternatives to what you see and assume must be right. Maybe you pray, Lord, help me accept your will because I believe your will be done, but I don't want to accept it. And maybe you pray that because in your self-awareness, you realize how unbelieving your heart is, how self-obsessed your heart is and how even though you can it's it the writing seems on the wall that god's will might be different than your will it's still really hard to accept and you sense that within yourself your proneness to kind of wander away from full trust in god maybe you pray my will be done because my will is best you just flat out my will be done because you cannot bring yourself to see that god is trustworthy no matter what he determines Knowing that this prayer that Jesus prayed was prayed before the crucifixion gives it its right context. The perfect man praying the most selfless prayer in full acceptance of God's will and the pain it would bring, absolute trust in God's absolute sovereignty and absolute goodness, because only God could take a death and produce goodness. Have you ever struggled to know what to pray? I know you have. That's a rhetorical it's a kind of silly question, pithy, right? But you have. You struggle to know what to pray all the time. Struggle to know what to pray all the time. A safe and faithful choice is always, not my will, but yours be done, Lord. And the sermon could end right there, right? That was a devotional, wasn't it? Did you catch that? You just got a whole devotional in three minutes. <laughs> but that's not what the text is about. The text is about demonic healings and and, and a lot of uh, spirit things happening in the spiritual realm that the Bible gives us kind of like a, a peer behind the curtain that there's always, when we ask for healing, ask for miracles, there's probably things happening that we cannot see. And the Bible kind of let, lets us peek around the curtain and see some of that stuff that's happening in heaven and on earth that we can look to and get hope from. If you struggle to pray the prayer, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Over the next two weeks, we're going to watch our Lord uh, focus his attention on healings. These are not um, congruent passages in the text. 
I pulled all the passages on healing from, from chapter uh, 4 through 6, and we're just going to look at what those things have in common. What are the themes? What is Jesus doing? What's his motivation? What does he say? What does he not say? How do people respond? How do they not respond? What is required for a miracle? What is not required for a miracle that you may be is c- convinced is required for a miracle? And you, I believe, through watching your Lord deal with his broken creation— You will see his compassion. You will see that his will is for the healing of the world, to restore it to what he intended the garden to be. And I believe you'll learn to trust him because you'll just see that he's in control and he is a good shepherd who means good. He means good for you. In many different ways, some that you might like or some your flesh might say is bad, but he means good and is doing good if we can learn to see it with the eyes of faith. So the first place we go in the text shows us that Jesus has authority over the spiritual realm and simultaneously that demons have the ability to make trouble. We see this from the the outset, from what you just heard read, an unclean demon is occupying this person. That does not mean that there's a clean demon and an unclean demon. It's just a descriptor, right? This this is a a demon, not an angel, though an angelic being, right? Who, Who is this person? An unclean demon says, I know who you are. Goes, ha! Like a, um, uh, just a, like a put down, really. Ha! I know who you are. Oh, so this demon is familiar with Jesus. That shouldn't surprise us. Jesus created him. Jesus probably could have called him by name and said, you were the 47th one made and I know you. And I know the number of hairs on your head too. And I know everything about you. And I know why you've rejected my will for you, which is to be called angel, messenger, but have chosen demon instead because you reject God's will, just like these image bearers (laughs) reject God's will. Jesus knows this demon. Demons are just, we call them fallen angels. What that, just, what that means is they refuse the, the, the appropriate title, angel, which means messenger. So they no longer do God's will. They no longer herald God's truth. They no longer give God's decrees. They're doing something else. And we catch one of them in the act here, just causing trouble. That is, that is what demons do. They just cause trouble because they're not about their father's business. The father's business, not their father's, the father's business. Jesus has met this demon before. Verse 34, verse 34, ha, what have you, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the holy one of God implies that this demon knows well who Jesus is too, which makes sense because he was created by him. Jesus was one of the first faces this demon ever saw when he was created, was the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit co-eternal, creating angels as messengers for a purpose. So they're well acquainted. And this demon knows he's the Holy One of God. One author suggests that the verbiage here implies that the demon know there's a holy war starting and that he's talking to the opposition, that the holy one of God is the demon's opposition in this holy war, which makes, okay, that makes sense as an interpretation because this demon thinks one one outcome of this holy war is I'm about to be destroyed. Have you come to destroy me? A possible, a possible outcome if, if Jesus so chooses, but that's not what Jesus is there for. Jesus is there to make clean what is unclean. And I find it so interesting that when Jesus casts out this demon, no harm had been done to the person. Wait, does that make any sense based on what we just heard? There was a man who had an unclean spirit, right? A man who had an unclean spirit And he cried out in a loud voice, but Jesus rebuked him, be silent, come out. He cast them out, and he had done them no harm. In other words, it's not just the casting out of a demon that we're seeing, it's healing. Why not a cast out of a demon and he's left wretched and haunted by the memories, and his body will never be the same, and he feels, I've had evil within me. No, 
there's no harm, which means he doesn't just remove the demon, but he removes whatever the results would be of, of a possession, right? And I'm not talking like Hollywood results. I'm talking about the, the internal, emotional, maybe sometimes physical, because we see physical op oppression in the Bible by demons too. People who feel, feel it, and, um, and, and, and maybe actually exhibit physical disease because they are occupied with a demon, oppressed, possessed by a demon. What is this word? How do other people respond? They say, what is this word? That word state, that word word means what is this statement? So all of this happens. The person has no harm upon them, an actual healing, a casting out, and a healing of the person to restore them to the pre-possessed state occurs. And what do people say? What is this word? What word are they referring to? They're referring to what Jesus said. Come out. And they say, what is this word? What is this statement? Because this statement has what? Power, authority. Whatever was in this guy had no choice but to listen to this rabbi. We've never heard any of the Pharisees be able to come to a person and say, come out. And whatever is harming this person has to fly out, like has to listen to the command. So literally that statement means that they perceive that Jesus has, and he does, power over things unseen things that they can't explain. So when a person is sick and things are happening that you can't see, Jesus knows, he sees what is unseen and has power over that too. That's why we, when we ask for healing, we say, Lord, I do say, Lord, I pray that Christie's, uh, Rob, what was the term? A liver, a, li a liver lesion, but they're gonna do a specific type of chemotherapy. I don't even know if this is where the liver is. I'm sorry, um, I did not take anatomy or listen when I took biology. So, you know, it's somewhere here. Rob, what's it called? The, the liver, liver mapping. I pray that the liver mapping shows something. I pray that God gives wisdom to these earthly physicians, but I have to know that my ultimate trust comes because there's a God who sees into what we don't even know exists. We say, Lord, I pray that they see molecules and atoms, and God's saying there's 10 levels below that that I can see. And I can attune it all for my will. So we come to the one who sees all things and say, you can see all things. That gives me confidence. So there's no one else I could turn to. No one I could turn to for what I'm asking. Because I do hope those things work, but I'm asking for way more. I'm asking that when all is said and done, no harm would look like it was ever done. That when the healing comes, you go, I feel better than I did five years ago. Jesus can do that, and he proves it right here. No harm had been done to this person. So there's a, there's a question that always comes up, like the natural question. Some of you are thinking it. I hope life groups talk about it. Okay, if demon possession is real, why don't we see it, number one? If demon possession is, to, uh, is real, does it happen today, number two? And like number three, should this be part of worship? Like, should I just say, hey, bring in the demon casted, the demon uh, possessed, and, and we're going to just pray? There's no, first, first of all, in the latter part, we've never seen a precedent for demonic uh, uh, expulsion being a part of New Testament worship. So the Bible doesn't say we should do that. But should we pray for the expulsion of demons? Yes. Do we have any biblical reason to think there's no such thing as demonic oppression or suppression or, or possession today? We have no reason to think that this is not happening. I will never forget, it was life-changing to hear a brother in Christ who had been praying for his marriage and praying for his marriage and praying for his marriage say, you know, we're six years into working on this thing, and some days I just still don't think our marriage is going to last. And unfortunately, I'm only getting now to the point that I'm starting to ask the Lord to heal us of what might be demonic oppression in our marriage. Six years in, and he goes, it never occurred to me. I got demons in my ear whispering. She has demons in her ear whispering. We might not feel possessed, but we can feel oppression. I've had this in my household. I've, I can look back at times in our life where my parenting and my, and, and my work -like life and everything, my, the, com the, the competing priorities and everything, I, I was blind. Where does that blindness come from? In part from flesh. But we cannot forget that there is a spiritual realm working against the church of Christ. So why don't we see it? 
I think you see it more than you know. First of all, I think we see it way more than we know, and we are ignorant to it, and we wait till six years in to dealing with an issue to start praying, oh, Lord, I forgot, uh, your word says there's a such thing as demons, and, and they cause trouble. They're troublesome, and wherever they can get in, they work to undo the works of God because they want to prevent salvations. They want to prevent healthy marriages. They want to prevent healthy families because why? Because those things produce healthy gospel communities where people get saved. So if I can destroy family units, destroy fam, uh, destroy marriages, uh, make children hate their parents and destroy generations, they can cause confusion through oppression, not possession. It might be that in this generation, demons realize they can accomplish so much by just staying out of us and whispering and letting our flesh do the rest. So Piper is helpful here. He says, occasionally you will see a manifestation of demonic power. I pray you start looking for them so that you don't live with unnecessary demons. That is so face-to-face -face and so oppressive and controlling in a person's life that an extraordinary intervention or exorcism is called for. It's and I add here, it's probably safe to say we don't think this way often enough and too many demonic oppressions are allowed to exist unnecessarily because we don't call upon our shepherd to rebuke demons in his name. Ask, I, I know you want, you probably part of you grew up in a context where it's like, we got to ask the elder to come rebuke. No, Jesus does the rebuke. You call on your shepherd and say, if, there, if, if there's oppression here, Lord, if, there, if there's, if, first of all, I know that hell is working against the church and hell is working against Christians, but if there's a particular thing happening where there's a demon that you know by name who is causing some problems, rebuke him in your own name. You can call upon Jesus to do that. You should call upon Jesus to do that. We're not just looking at things that happen historically, but they are in part prescriptive for how we should live today. Piper continues, I've been involved in one exorcism in my life, only one, but I've read about others that happen much more uh, commonly on the international mission field where we are moving into places where entire cultures are explicitly demon-driven, which might be why it happens more in the mission field, because you're talking about cultures that worship the demons, right? Right? We don't have a culture that worships the demons. We worship the things the demons put in front of us. Some of you worship sports. And I'm not talking about the pros. And I'm not talking about college. I'm talking about your child's sports. Just to get right into the middle of everything and throw a grenade and lose some of you. Some of you worship yourself. Some of you spend a lot of time focusing on the me, on self-satisfaction. And I throw me in here too. I'm a ridiculous Orlando Magic fan. You guys know that. Like, we're 2-0 and and I feel like we're going to the championship. <laughs> so I rebuke that idea in Jesus' name that that should make me so much more excited than so many other things. Piper says, how do we, how can we see, uh, he asks the question, he poses the question, how can we see uh, exorcisms today? And again, not Hollywood exorcisms with spinning heads and vomiting demons. How can you see oppression that was once there, gone, the burden's gone, the weight is lifted? And he, he proposes 2 Timothy 2, that second, when 2 Timothy 2 happens, you see the demons, you see Satan losing his power. How? The Lord's servant must be kind to everyone. You must be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Speaking to elders for sure, because able to teach sounds like a call to the requirement of the office of elder. But don't, don't lose sight of here of the benefit to the church that all people be kind, all people be able to teach, all people be patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. What's the result? Listen, listen. God may perhaps grant them 
the people listening, repentance that leads to truth, and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. People you meet that just seem innocent and just needing some love or go in the wrong direction are sometimes captured by him. The text of scripture says captured by him in his camp without knowing it, fulfilling his desire without knowing it. They are in his snare, in his trap. They got their foot in a spiritual bear trap and don't realize the pain they're in because of it. And how are they set free from this? By the continued gentleness of God's people teaching truth. That, that if they receive truth, their eyes would be opened. And through that, they'd be set free from their spiritual bondage. And set free from the one who used to have authority over them to do his will. There's more demonic activity around us than we're probably comfortable admitting because when you do that, it kind of like shatters our perception of reality and it can kind of make you, <laughs> you're freaking out right now. Part of some of you are just freaking out. I'll just say it like you're thinking, no, no, I prefer a reality where what I see is all there is because that's what I can control and that I have to pray less about. There's your problem. If you believe in a naturally um, elemental world that is that goes beyond the seeable, then you have to cry out for God to take care of the things you cannot see because you're helpless. Admitting there's a spiritual realm is an admission of your helplessness against it. You want healing, admit you're helpless. If you want miracles, if you want Jesus to come and do this when you need it, admit your helplessness that only he has power and authority over all things. This demon had to listen, and this de demon called him son of God, the Christ, Messiah. The demon has to say he has authority. And the de if the demon's got to say Jesus has authority over the unseen, the demon says Jesus has authority authority over me, why wouldn't you believe it? You're disagreeing with the, the, the demon's own admission if you say, I'm not quite sure Jesus' authority goes everywhere in all of that unseenness. It does. This should be good news. Good news. Because you can say, Lord, I don't know if all my problems are just my exceptional ability to mess things up. <laughs> or if what I'm seeing there's some demonic things happening. And maybe, maybe the people in my household, maybe I am just listening to lies rather than relying on your word. Lord, whatever it is, if there is anything outside me causing this, just would you rebuke it? Would you come to it in a way like you did for that man with the unclean spirit? Lord, consider me the man with an unclean spirit and come rebuke in me anything that is not of you. Whether it's coming from me or it's coming from the outside. That's spiritual warfare. Do you hear me? When you, read, when you read in Ephesians 6 about what spiritual warfare is, that's spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare isn't that someone took your table at seasons 52 and you're upset about it. Spiritual warfare is demonic oppression in this world against God's people, and our only hope is the one who's already had victory over all of it. So ask him, come rebuke in me what is wrong, and come rebuke in me what may be demons, demonic the will of Satan. Because it might be that even though it has been set free, we become like zombies who are still living like we're under the control of the will of the one who once ensnared us. Let it not be so. This is good news for us. It should shape our doctrinal beliefs because it should shape our angelology and demonology. Those are real words. I did not just make them up. It should. And you should have an angelology and a demonology. Many of you have an angelology because we've been going through Hebrews and Exodus and I've been teaching about the angel of the Lord and how to interpret what is a, a messenger of God and what is Jesus, a Christophany in your Old Testament. You have some angelology, but demonology sounds like it's for the Catholics. Some of you Baptists go, amen. That sounds like that is for the Catholics. It's not. It's in the Bible. Get with it. Understand what is working against you and what enemies you may have allowed into your camp for far too long. Ask that Jesus would find out the foxes in your vineyard and get them out.
Amen. That's point number one. Hallelujah. So where do we go next? We see Jesus. He hears an intercess- intercessory prayer. This is powerful. Jesus hears intercessory requests. Jesus hears intercessory requests. We see this happen when uh, he goes to the house of Simon. This is Simon Peter, one of his, one of the 12. And Simon's mother-in-law has a fever. And, and we don't diminish fevers, do we? Right? We have a demonic possession, and then someone's got a fever? Does Jesus go, listen, I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm, out, I'm out here casting out demons, and you want me to come in here and heal a, a sore tooth? Oh, boo, poor baby. No, and he, he takes care of the fever. So Jesus takes care of, of everything. He's there. This paints him as the one who cares about the big and the small when it comes to, to the people he created. He cares about the little things, too. So underline this in your Bible. Underline this. And I'll, I'll, I forget what verse it is. Let me look at, at it for you. Verse 30, I believe it's 38. I'll get there. Yes, 38. You want to underline the phrase, they appealed to Jesus on her behalf. They appealed to Jesus on her behalf. She's not able to appeal to Jesus, is she? She's not able to say, well, this is what I'm feeling. This is how I feel, and this is how it's making me feel, and I worry that it might be something that I ate, and the details. She's not asking on her own behalf. People appeal to Jesus and his ability to heal all things on her behalf. She's healed without having prayed anything. Why? Because the prayer of your brothers and sisters in Christ can accomplish much in your life. And your prayers for your brothers and sisters in Christ can accomplish things they don't even know happened because someone next to me was praying. Like, I'm sensing this is making sense to you because I'm hearing more amens and oh, rabble rabbles this morning because we're getting to a place. This is what that means. This is a place I'm appealing to you in right now where you're not prepared. You feel ill-equipped. And that's why it's impacting you because you realize you're probably not praying enough. Look down your row. Look down your row right now. You're probably not praying for those faces you see enough. And you're getting a little convicted about that. Oh, that's good. Teach us about intercessory prayer. Then comes the Holy Spirit and goes, do you do it? And you go, oops, <laughs> darn. You know, well, I do it on the big things. I'm praying for Mel Sanders. I'm praying for Christy. I'm going home and praying those things. Yes. Do you pray for the good, though? Do you spend your time going down the church directory, partners, because you have access to a pictured directory? Do you go down to a directory saying, Lord, just would you grant this person supernatural wisdom? Would you just grant this person a heart for apostolic missions? Would you go, do you pray for the good things or do you wait for people to be on their last leg or in need of a, I'm sorry, a liver mapping in order to finally lift them up in prayer? I hate to think what would have happened to her if her, Daughter and son-in-law didn't say, this is, a pro- this, is a, this is a problem for Jesus. Who are you going to call? You call the Messiah. And they, pr- they, they ask on her behalf, Lord, heal her. And he listens. He doesn't have to say, I need to get her consent on this. I need to know that this is what she wants. He listens to what they want. It's a good thing they ask on her behalf. And he heals. This should just be powerful to us. A.W. Tozer said, The church that is not jealously protected by mighty intercession, think of our intercessors, all of you should be, but our great intercessors are like the the infantry walking the wall of the church. If we were a fortress or a barracks, they walk the wall of the church and they look out for the enemy. And they go, oh, I see it. I see it. We could fall into self-obsession. We could think we're the best church in town. Lord, I, I intercede for all of our people that you would help us all be humble. That's what intercession looks like. Intercessions are the Intercessors are the people with great discernment who walk the wall. And Tozer says, if we're not doing that with sacrificial labor of prolonged, not just before you're having a meal, prayer, a church like that is likely to become an abode of every evil thing and hiding a hiding place for unsuspected corruption. The creeping wilderness will soon take over it, take over that church that trusts in its own strength and forgets to watch 
and pray. Pray for me. Intercede for me. Intercede for your elders. Intercede for our staff members. And intercede for everyone in your row. It's your homework this week. Remember those faces. And if you don't know them, just say, you know, you know, fourth row, that nice looking lady. I see her every week and go, hi, and I never talked to her before. But Lord, I, I pray, pray that you strengthen her for the Great Commission. I pray that you give her a, 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 a mixture of being a, a working Martha and the heart of a Mary who loves her Savior. And you just let what prayers come to you. The Spirit leads you in how to pray for that person. He knows. And if you're like, I don't know what to pray, he interprets with groans you don't understand and knows what she needs. And he will honor your time thinking about that person and lifting them up in prayer. Richard Foster says, if we truly love people, we will desire for them good. We will desire for them good things. And we have the power to give it to them by praying for it from our Savior on their behalf without them knowing. And this will lead us to prayer, intercession in a way of love. It's a way, he says, of loving others. So think of washing feet. When you pray for someone, you're washing their feet like Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. So are you interceding? And my follow-up question is, why not? Why not? Well, Jesus, listen to this. It should shape us, and we should say, there's probably things I should be praying that I'm not. People I could be praying for that I'm not. Remember Foster's words, you can pray good on behalf of those around you. Lord, would you teach our children to follow you at a young age? Lord, would you take our teenagers and strengthen them and show them their purpose in the kingdom, that they're unique and have a calling in you to know you, but then to do great things for you that only you can supply the power for. So help them to be humble and to seek you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Pray for marriages. Pray for parents. Pray for the single. Pray for the widow. Pray for the orphan. You can be interceding all the time. And then Jesus, we see, uh, he hears intercessory requests, yes, but we see also that healings are ultimately dependent on God's will. Like, so you're praying things, right? You're praying them and you're saying, Lord, I know that all of this is it's just, it's the prayer of a humble person, right? Like my wife actually didn't know what I was preaching on today. And said, so when we were <laughs> this morning getting ready, she, she said, oh, the prayer of a, of a, what is it you said? The prayer of a, of, a, of a good woman or a humble woman can just change her husband's heart. And I, and I said something in jest that I probably shouldn't have said. And I was like, oh, but I feel bad about that. That I feel bad about that. She prays for me all the time. She prays for me all the time. She prays for me in the front row, grabs my leg, and just says a silent prayer every time before I preach because a prayer of a person who intercedes for the good of someone else has an effect on that person and has a, an, a, an unseen effect in the spiritual realm where God is like, oh, okay, he's going to need extra help today. <laughs> and she knew it because she's married to him. And she prays for him. And he doesn't fall flat because of his wife, because of a person, a sister in Christ praying. But all things happen according to God's will, don't they? They all happen to God's will. That's point number three. Point number three, healings are ultimately dependent on God's will. And we see that here from Luke 5, 12 through 16. If we go ahead, go forward a little bit. Luke 5, 12 through 16. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face, begged him, Lord, if it's your will, you can make me clean. And Jesus' response is, I will be clean. It's that simple here. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for, for a proof of them. That way he can return to normal life like he's no longer a leper, like there's no harm ever done to him in the first place. But now even more, the report about him went abroad because that guy probably told a thousand people. <laughs> and everywhere that guy shows up that he's been rejected from lately because he is white as snow with leprosy, people go, how did this happen? Maybe they pry it out of him. But the report gets around that this is Jesus of Nazareth, that guy who's going around teaching great things and healing people. He's the one who restored this man from leprosy. But he would withdraw in verse 16, 
to a desolate place to pray. Just as a side note, if Jesus has to withdraw and pray, so do you. A total tangent, but you need to withdraw and pray in your life too. But notice, the standout here is this exchange. If you will, I will. It's that simple. And the question, if the, the uh, premise here is, I believe you can just say you will and I'll be cleaned. This person has faith to trust that Jesus can instantaneously heal. heal. And Jesus' response is, I heal. I, I will be clean. And what is the result? More people find out. More people find out about who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing in the area. So the big picture, the big picture of healing, something we have to take into account no matter what healing you read about. You will, hear, you will read things like your faith has made you well. That causes a great disconnect in the church where, where we start to tell people you're not healed because your faith isn't big enough. That's your fault. This is your sin that is causing you to not be healed. That is, that is the wrong avenue to go down. And, and this passage makes it clear. The simple exchange, if you will, I will. It is Jesus' authority to say, I will not because I have a reason not to. Trust me, what you don't need is me to heal that thing. Remember earlier when I said we have to find our trust in the one who can see all the unseen things and true trust that allows us to pray, not my will, but yours be done, is the person who says, if you heal that thing, it might end up in my bad. It might be toward my destruction that you heal this thing. So we have to say, your will be done. Perhaps if your prayers are more like the latter three in my introduction, Lord, please my will, or Lord, help me accept your will, or my will be done because it's best, it's, it's because you struggle with this. The reality that Scripture teaches is that all healings are dependent upon God's sovereign will. So we, yeah, we don't stop praying, stop interceding. We just start saying, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm praying to the person who knows better than me. So forgive me, Lord, if, if in my frailty, I see these needs and I think I know the answer, I'm going to pray in that direction. But I trust you, Lord. And whatever your will is, help all to accept it. Do you struggle when Jesus is not healing you? Or are you... Or if he's not answering in the way you want because your primary concern is your will, possibly, rather than God's will. Jesus does what is in accordance with God's will because he's the perfect son who claims oneness with the Father. So we can't ask of Jesus, do what I want, even if it's not in the Father's will, because we're asking him not to be one with the Father anymore. We're asking him to become like us. We're asking him to be a sinner like us. If we say, I would rather you just listen to me on this one. Rather than even asking you to help me accept what is your will, I really want you to just bend to me because I think I know best or I can't live. I don't know how I can live without having this go my way. If we want to believe in a triune God, if we want to believe the words of Jesus who is one with the Father, then we have to believe Jesus knows God's immaculate will and is the only person to ever live it out and be able to say, I will. We don't have, that I know of, any episode of him saying, certainly not explicitly, I will not. But while he was on earth, he didn't heal everything. He left the nation of Israel still looking militarily and socially crippled. He didn't heal everything. He didn't make the earth new yet. We trust that's coming. But in the time, he didn't heal everybody. Not everyone was brought to him. He didn't go to every nation on earth, did he? He was here for a short time. And what he did is like a foretelling. It's like a foretaste of glory divine, of all things being made new, of all healings coming in eternity. So it is God's will sometimes not to heal. And scripture makes that evident by him not healing everything in his first coming. But scripture makes it equally evident he will heal all things in his second coming. Lastly, number four, Jesus knows what is best and always does it. 
See, because I don't want you to look at point number three and think, well, Jesus is just like uh, the, the, the dog's tail, just wagging if the father says so. This is not a tail wagging the dog or dog wagging the tail thing. Jesus is in unison with the father's will. And therefore, he has supernatural perception to look at any situation and know what is right. And I want to show you that he will always do what is right. That's something you can have confidence in. Look at verses 6 through 11 in chapter 6. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts. Oh, right there. Jesus knows. Jesus always knows. Always, always knows. He knows their thoughts. And he said to the man with a withered hand, come stand right here. So he's not going to say to the man, let's go outside and I'll do this quietly. He makes an example of this teaching, which is important uh, because this is the Sabbath. And he's about to, from the point of view of the Pharisees, break a law, but it's a man-made law. It's not the law of God. And he rose and he stood there and Jesus said to him, to the, to the audience, said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to destroy it? What, what's the answer? It's never going to be lawful to do wrong, right? That's kind of a rhetorical question. G what Jesus is really saying is, I have to do good seven days a week. Why would you expect me, just because this is the Sabbath, not to do good? When I have the ability to heal this man, you want me to follow a man-made law that would deny him healing? It's a lot to paraphrase, but it's all in there. And after looking around at them, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Again, he wants this on display. He doesn't want anyone in the room to miss what happens. Everyone looking at the hand, boom, and the man is healed. Goes from withered to able to use his hand again. And he did so, and his hand was restored. And they were filled with fury, and they discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. He puts it on display. Is it lawful? Of course, it's lawful to do good, and he does it. Only Jesus, it's remarkable, especially when he's dealing with Pharisees or Sadducees, any religious leader, or any haughty person who thinks that the rich young ruler, any person who thinks they've got it figured out. And Jesus says, you don't. There's things you're not paying attention to. Let me show you what you don't see. And he shows them, what he, and though they don't see it, what they don't see, which is their own sin. They don't want good being done to this person. They'd rather see Jesus fall under the religious leaders of the time than do good. And he shows them. You can take comfort in that. You can take comfort because you know no matter what is happening spiritually, demonic, Satan, no matter what people in the room are saying, no matter who's for you or who you perceive might be against you, Jesus knows the perfect social way to either appease all parties or annoy the ones who should be annoyed because they're the sinners in this <laughs> analogy. And Jesus always knows what is right and does it. And he does it in a way that he knows will get them talking about how to kill him. Look at the last verse. This, things like this, when Jesus does this, this is what pokes the bear until they finally crucify him. Because he says, come right into the middle. He puts it right on display so there's no doubt. You thought word spread quick because one leper was healed? Imagine everyone in the synagogue goes home and says, this brash, the audacity of this rabbi, and some of them are saying, oh man, the audacity of this rabbi. Some of them are excited about him, some hate it. And it's what leads to his crucifixion. So he does what is right at his own expense. And if a man, a God, anyone will do what is right at their own expense, they're worth listening to does right at his own expense. And here is this sermon's most difficult thing for me to say, the most difficult question. Some of you are thinking it already. Is Jesus always right? Even when those seeking healing in the here and now 
have to hear from him. Yes, I will. But you have to come up to heaven for that. I will heal you. But when you're in my presence is when it'll happen. And our struggle there is that we, because we're human, we struggle to see death as good. For the believer, we should realize to die and, and to live are both Christ and both gain. But, but separation is hard. Very difficult. It's been 17 years since my mother died. I'm getting close to the point very soon that I will have lived longer without her than I got the chance to live with her. That pains me every day. She would love our kids. She would love Daisy. She would be in the front row. Saying amen so much, it kind of annoys you all, and I have to go, listen, you're being a distraction. I know you love me. And there are days I would say, oh, I'd take it. I'd trade anything. But then that is so selfish of me to want to withdraw her or retract her back out of the presence of God where cancer was cured to say, yeah, but I have a need for her. I have a will for her. Lord, that's me going, my will, please, my, my will. But would Jesus equate death with healing? Yes. Would Jesus equate death with good? Yes, which is why he chose death. When we see him do right at the expense of death in this last point, it is just a foreshadowing of the way he'll do it on the cross. Like I said earlier, the, the safest prayer is always not my will, but your will be done, Lord. And we see Jesus do that when he goes to the garden. If the garden where he prays shows us anything, it's that Jesus will fight, pay any cost, fight against any human desire, against even his own human desire to live in order to do what is right. The depiction of Jesus in the garden is a person in the human experience fighting to do what is right. Fighting an inward battle, a spiritual battle of temptation to avoid the cross and instead go to the cross because he will do right even when it costs him his life. Matthew captured it. Jesus went out to the garden to pray. He began to be sorrowful. He began to be troubled. He knew that his time, his arrest was near, that the day of his crucifixion was at hand. In a few more hours, it would be midnight, and the day of his crucifixion will have come. And he said to his disciples, my soul is sorrowful, even to death. In other words, the pain of what was coming, just the emotional toll could kill him. It feels like the pain of the emotions are so deep that they could kill him right then and there. And then he walked a little further and he fell flat on his face. Jesus, flat on the ground, this is not hyperbole, his face to the dirt, sprawled out and praying to the Father, if there's any way. If there's any other way to redeem them that might not cost me this suffering, please let it be so, please. But I know it is so much more important that your will be done. It is more important not to get what I want right now and have the right thing happen. He goes back to his disciples and he finds that they're quite comfortable sleeping and then he goes off a second time to pray, and he says, My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but your will be done. And he came to his disciples and found them a second time sleeping. He reprimanded them for their lack of spiritual vigilance. And then he went away a second time to pray, a third time to pray. And he said, The same, my father. If this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping. And he said, sleep later, sleep later. See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is coming toward me now. 
And he was arrested, and all his disciples fled, ran away, and Jesus handed himself over against the inclinations of his mind and heart and body and soul. It's all telling him, run from this. He hands himself over to do what is right and let right happen at his own great, great, great cost in order to redeem you, in order to set you free from captivity, in order that you might trust him and receive salvation for the forgiveness of your sin. Jesus always does what is right. These are trustworthy, trustworthy words, friends. He will always do what is right for you. Lord, that is the struggle of these texts. When we see ourselves oppressed, when we see ourselves with fever, when we see ourselves outcast, when we see ourselves withered, spiritually and physically and emotionally withered, and we say, why has help not come? Where are you? And we wonder why our healing is delayed. The temptation of our flesh is to either blindly keep waiting and waiting or to, bl or to blame ourselves and our lack of faith. Help us to maintain faith and first of all, trust that you're a good God who does come and heal and often says, I will. And we pray for many I wills in this room today for all sorts of healings that are needed. Would you give us faith and help us celebrate that what wasn't done in your in your first coming, not the healing of the world, will be accomplished in your second coming. And every need will be met. Sin will go away. The effects of sin will go away. No one will be possessed any longer. No one will be oppressed or withered any longer. No one will have fever or runny nose or, or anything or headaches any longer. No one will be outcast because of their leprosy. No one will feel on the margins because of their plight any longer. You're going to make all things new. And that's a reason to celebrate greatly, even if in the present we struggle with it. It's something we can look forward to, marvel in, and thank you for. And we ask that you would make us thankful this morning that you are a healer, that you always do what is right, you're trustworthy. You do what is right when it costs you infinitely more than what it costs us. Thank you for being that kind of shepherd who listens to the prayers of his people for themselves and for one another and answers. In your name we pray. Amen.